here at the Lego Group, play is our work. So it makes a lot of sense that we play at work. But what does that actually mean? Play at work is an interesting and underestimated concept. When we think about work, um, play might seem counterintuitive. I think for all, probably for a lot of companies, a lot of businesses, it is counterintuitive to play at work. But in the business of play, play is work for us. So much so that we have a very special secret lab dedicated just to play. It's, it's dedicated to its innovation, its evolution, and the how and why um, of play. Hello, and welcome again to a very special episode of Live Behind the Bricks. I'm coming at you today from always sunny Bill in Denmark, and I'm super excited to see so many people are already joining online for today's session. And I know that many of you will be watching the replay, so a warm Lego welcome wherever and whenever you're tuning in. Today we're meeting uh, colleagues from the Super Secret Creative Play Lab, and I'm going to be asking them loads of questions to find out exactly what it is that they do, what is that lab all about, how they do what they do, and how they apply play into their everyday work. So uh, not all those questions need to come from me. They can also come from you. There's a little box down there with a question mark in it. It's a Q&A box. You can drop your uh, questions in there. We'll try to get to as many as we can. If we don't get to them during this call, we'll try to get back to you um, and answer the questions after the, after the call. So let's get started. Through the magic of modern podcasting technology, my amazing Lego colleagues will now join me on the screen. Ah, it worked. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> Go around and introduce ourselves. Hi. Uh, let's, uh, since Liz said hi first, let's uh, start with you. Hi, I'm Liz. I'm Head of Play Discovery uh, at Creative Play Lab, and that's a capability built on how kids play, and discovery is in our DNA, and I am here from sunny, rainy, stormy London. Fantastic. Welcome, Liz. Amy? Hello, hello. Um, I'm Amy and I'm head of play propositions. And that means we, my team are responsible for taking what we discover and think is going to pioneer play in the world and decide how we actually put it into the world. And I am coming at you from a really stormy Oxford. <laughs> pioneer play. We're going to get into that. I love that, that terminology. Brian, you're up next. Hey guys and gals, I'm Brian. I'm what's known as a mission lead at Lego, which is a little nice way of saying that they've given me an impossible task and they said, go out and try and figure out how to do it, well, however that is. And so um, my impossible task involves interactivity and in the general sense. And so um, I work in, in very large random places all over Lego. So uh, um, good, glad to be with you. Welcome. Andy, I have you next on the screen. Yep. Hello, my name's Andy. I'm heading up the Play Engineering Organization, uh, which is an organization that's responsible for designing, building, and maintaining all of the technology-enabled interactivities within the Lego portfolio. Uh, and I'm calling in today from sunny slash rainy Denmark. <laughs> Lovely. Thanks. Toby? Hey, Toby. Um, yeah, I'm in the experimental research team. Um, and that's an uh, awesome job where I get to, uh, yeah, observe, watch, be with kids, kind of championing their play needs, figuring out what they need so that we're working towards that. And yeah, by the same way, de-risking the propositions and concepts we put out into the world. And I'm just outside London in Essex, but still experiencing the storm and the rain. I love the weather forecast in there. Yeah, there's a lot of <laughs> Thanks, Toby. Lily, you're up. Hello everyone, I'm Lily, joining today from London, um, same weather, sunny, plus stormy, <laughs> raining, and I'm a director of Play AI at the Creative Play Lab, so here we shape the focus of AI to enrich the play experiences, so uh, we work on the areas that AI can help to you know, foster the curiosity and grow confidence in the child. Wow. You all have very uh, scientific and interesting sounding jaws. I want to get to that in a second. Everyone who's joining us online, if you want, please uh, please um, tip in with where you're joining us from. And if you feel like it, give us the weather report. Uh, in a very but, playful way, I think. In a very yeah. playful way, yeah. <laughs> um, so when we talk about play in the Lego group, I heard a lot of scientific sounding things. It sounds like research and development in a lot of ways. Should we, should we start there? Yeah, I, 
I actually you think go. it's kind of oh go on <laughs> you go Amy <laughs> okay Okay, cool. Um, I actually think it's a state of mind. I think there is part of research and development because it's curiosity. It's, you know, we're really delving into kind of the unknown. We're on that kind of frontier where it's like, which direction do we go in? Um, but I think it's a lot deeper than just research and development, though. Um, and I think, you know, we bring kind of like that real, you know, playfulness to life and everything we do, inventing, creating, imagining worlds, you know, using improv and bringing people together um pretending and you know really using that kind of like imaginative kind of like sixth seventh eighth and tenth sense to the realm of this as well in that exploration so i i actually think it's a lot deeper than just research and development i, was I gonna... think part, I, I think part of the reason that you get that feel is because some of the titles feel that way but it's more just simply because we've got so many different ways of looking at play that we're trying to understand more deeply and so we have a bit of a scientific experiment, you know, sort of experimental mindset with some of these things. But because of the nature of what it is that we're studying, we're knee deep in silliness at the same time. And so they, like, yes, I want to understand kids more. But the, the part of kids that I want to understand is about how they fluidly go from one type of play to another or how they include whatever the heck is sitting in front of them or how they just ignore the rules. And that's not all that scientific. So I was I was going to say that actually, and maybe it's because of the world I sit in, that it can be 100% research and development, partly because research is part of my world. And the, it's not R&D as you may know it. And I think that's the difference. It's R&D like front and center with the kids involved in it. So we are playing with the kids in order to research and develop what we're doing. It's truly co-creation. It's not exclusively behind the scenes in a little secret lab when no one else gets involved. I think that is the difference, is that we don't then bring something into the world and say, ta-da, actually kids have been part of the process all the way through. And I was curious to know what Toby, if you would agree with me, but for me, like R&D for us is synonymous with play. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, yeah, I do get the words labs come through and experimentation and yeah, I guess we're not in a, science lab where we're mixing chemicals but we are mixing fun and play and kind of figuring out what works and what levers to pull in the same way that yeah maybe science and R&D most traditional R&D would but we get to do it in a fun way and the key ingredients is fun so probably looks a bit different to the outside. Yeah, I did hear in, in the introduction, I think it was you, Andy, you mentioned something about technology, though. So there is there a tech, heavy tech component to what you're doing? There is. Uh, I mean, that's pretty much my my day job and night job. Um, but but I think to to, you know, really resonate with, with what the colleagues have said, I think when we think about technology is not just for the sake of oh, what's the latest and greatest. Right. It's really about how can we help to enhance the curiosity actually drive you know the curiosity to, to play more to learn more uh, so i think we're thinking about applying technology very differently uh, at the lego group than you probably would have seen in, in some of the other high-tech industries mm -hmm. and i guess part of that lily you mentioned ai so I, I guess there must be a part of that sort of technology yeah yeah exactly so like play and uh, you know play and r d so when we talk about ai um a lot of people may think like you know ai is pretty much r d work but you know how to integrate it the play as um in, into the r d so come along so the play is uh, this kind of creative process that come along with a formal r d effort especially in the technology uh, development work so this would allow us to you know to push the boundary of what's possible and which can lead on um, development of new technologies. Hmm. Yeah, I'd love to pick up on maybe some innovation. You're talking about new, new technologies. I get the sense that some of those new technologies might be how we sort of look at play, but how is it that we innovate play? Is that, is that part of that process? It, it's a really tricky one, right? Because when you're on the frontier and you're doing innovation, you don't know which questions you're asking just yet. You know, sometimes there's a world of kind of like unknown and unforeseen, and that's how you can start to uncover the newness. You know, sometimes we do have observations and we have insights and play needs, but there are occasions where we're in that world where we're not quite sure what to uncover. 
And I think that's where it gets really, really interesting because we have to create new methodologies. We have to look at things from different perspectives. And I think play really helps with that because being on that frontier means you have to be fearless, you know, and having that kind of like play sense builds resilience. It kind of like helps us to go into those unknown places, just like kids do when they're exploring and they're being wondrous. So it really helps to kind of like I help us to push to go into those kind of like really brave and curious territories. Um, but, but, you know, I mean, I love the work that Amy and, and Toby do as well to help to bring some of that to life as well. So there's different stages in which we're at as well to find the innovation and new types of play. How much is storytelling a part of that? I mean, I mean so much. Yeah. Say, I was just going to say so much. Whether we like interrupt each other and with our own stories and start and stop, where do we start and stop? Um, what What were you going to say, Brian? Around that, you jump in. I mean, I was just going to say that play in general is a lot about stories, and so of course mm -hmm. we have to incorporate stories into what we do because that's how kids play, and and adults and dogs. You know what I mean? Like like every everybody plays by sort of like putting themselves into a different place or, or a similar place with different rules or whatever it is. But like, the point is, is like, it's not, you can only go so far with your fun until you have to like explain it to somebody else and get them involved. And that usually involves a story, right? Like, like to, to me, that's part of the last question you even asked with tech is that we don't want to push tech because we want to push tech. We want to push tech because we want to get deeper into people's stories. We want to understand them. We want to be able to incorporate them and we want to be able to help them riff with their story, right? And yeah. so story is kind of, if, if, if the models and the play that we're providing on the table are, are sort of the raw materials, then the story is the kind of like background music that's just constantly going, that kind of the emotional ups and downs, right? And so that's just as important as the models and the, and the little bits of play. Yeah, I, yeah, and I well, think there's a big part of um, what, what we're really trying to focus on is how do we create that immersiveness, right, to children? Because mm -hmm. if we think about story, right, a lot of us think about, oh, you're reading a book. Uh, is it audio only? Is it video? And I think for us, it's really that that mixed dimensional sort of an immersive type of experience that we're actively trying to explore across the organization, right? And trying to figure out what's the right moment in time when we can provide those kind of immersiveness uh, to, to help to really build into that story, right? Is it a Ninjago? Is it a castle? Is it a magic spell? So I think there's a lot of those interesting pieces of story, right? And I think that's a really interesting question for us. Uh, as a team and and I think as a whole we're actively trying to tackle that in various different ways yeah I was just going to add that for the kids you know that we're playing with co-creating with in the innovation process the storytelling around imagine if what could it what what if imagine if what could it be you know you have if you start with that story and you have them help you along the way, then we sort of almost get to more interesting places. And then I was gonna say part of what the rest of the team were also looking at is when we're taking something new and different into the world, you know, the wonderful thing about Lego is that it people have a really strong perception of what we do and what our products look like, feel like, play like. And actually when you're in the innovation lab at Lego, if you don't tell a really good story in the world, then they just think, this is what you do. This is, we've always known this. It's like, you've got this amazing brand, this amazing product, this amazing ex play experience. That's what we, that's what we know you for. And that when you're in the innovation lab, you have to tell a different story to help people understand that we're also on a journey. You know, Brian's working in interactivity, Lily's working in AI. That's not what people think of as the world that Lego occupies, but that is a hundred percent where play, the play we build sits. And so there's a story associated with helping to change perception, helping to change the wonder of play in everybody's lives, that it isn't just a playtime on your own with certain people, that actually Lego can be everything to everyone. And that's what we're here to kind of change the narrative around. That's yeah, and I think like with every story, we every story has characters, right? And I think the cool thing is we get to stay empathetic and with... <laughs> We say users, but at the end of the day, the characters we're focused on is the kids and they get to be the main person in the story where 
trying to figure out and figuring out to tell and kind of yeah that exploratory and discovery phases of the work it still is at the center of it all mm -hmm. what does the character our main character need and want and play and enjoy and have fun and that's the kid it's also good to hear. yeah I think to, I mean story Sorry. innovation will lead to the capture of the kids' imagination. Basically, is what we're yeah. we're kind of trying to summarise it all to. But we could talk about it for an hour and hour and hour. And hours, I, think. James, I, I you... think the other thing I was going to quick mention is just Lego itself has a really long story, right? This is a hundred year old company almost, and they're they're a beautifully optimized company, right? They can deliver boxes of greatness to kids all over the planet. They're like a weird version of Santa Claus. And so the fact that like we're in an innovation part of Lego means that we get to help craft maybe future parts of the story. And it's like a really kind of privileged place to be because there's such huge reach at Lego. And so like being in a place where you can help them steer in certain directions is, is, is really like a, a very humbling place to sit because you're, you're, you're sitting behind a very powerful force of good, right? And, and helping them sort of, leap over some of the like potholes and it's and it's and it's a great place to be that's that's interesting i think um one of the things that i heard earlier amy mentioned was interactivity that you're exploring interactivity i think it, there's a perception sometimes that that lego is a bit solitary in in the way that we play with it or or at least maybe some of our experiences uh, if we're kind of older generation um uh, we might have experienced lego play as solitary can you talk a little bit about that because this is going to lead into the one of the questions that's come up on the screen yeah i mean i was just going to jump in with you know some of the stuff that we we would be looking at when we look at like the pioneering of play and the future our future commitment to play as an organization is what are the growing needs and expectations and you know interactivity but really social connection you know, we, we've all experienced the loss of that over the last few years. And as a result, the need for it, the growth of that need, um, you know, it's it's exponential. So we want to tap into that. So I'm not the person to answer the questions about what interactivity we're up to. There will be a there's a hell of a lot going on behind the scenes that we can't actually talk to you about, Jake. Sorry. Yeah. Well, <laughs> exactly. well. The secret that we're pretty much everyone on this call is working on some pretty awesome stuff behind the scenes that you'll get to you'll get to see soon enough um but did someone want to jump in about like the interactivity specifically and why it's so important i was starting with the play need and like the social connection that we see in the social play that's just rising and bubbling in terms of I, need i was going to actually use it as a segue because there's a question in here about hidden side and i think you know when hidden side was first launched it's still it, it, it was a bit so well but then this interactivity, um, this idea that you could play together competitively came into it. And I think that's sort of interesting. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about that sort of AI, uh, sorry, AR, um, AR type of play and uh, if we're exploring that anymore and, and what interactivity means if there are other ways that we look at interactivity. I, it's, this is gonna be one of those really strange ones where it's like, Maybe we can't say what we can't say, um, because I think, you know, by answering that one, we we may be going into the, the secret realm. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know whether there's a, a, a way I, out of this. I just say that not, not necessarily. Uh, we can't really answer what's coming out, what's in the pipeline. But when we talk about it in terms of interactivity, you know, how, how we design... Um, that sort of collaborative I mean, play or yeah. the idea of, yeah. Yeah, and I think a, a huge part of, a, of what we get inspiration from is really looking at where kids are today and where they're going to be in the next, you know, five, 10, 15 years, right? So if you think about things like augmented reality or gaming, for example, right? We, need, we know kids, a lot of kids are into it, right? And that's one of the reasons why Lego last year also has a huge sort of investment into Epic Games. Uh, we understand that's where kids are today. So I think for us as an organization, it's really trying to figure out how do we really create that uh, kind of a mixed realm of digital and physical, right? That's interactive, that's fun, that makes sense for the kids. Uh, because we will also understand that not every single child or parents like, you know, having their kids staring in, in front of a screen for, you know, five, six, 
six hours a day and then also not every single kid will love to have physical play right but i think for us is how do we really understand uh you know the, the right balance between those two paradigms right learn from it and really kind of create a set of interactivity that's truly unique uh, and that really is fit for, for purpose uh, for the children of tomorrow i think what's really exciting though is is you know what amy was saying before as well about and toby as well in that kind of like observation and co-creation with kids and what we can explore there are moments when we just kind of like step back and go wow how come we haven't seen that before you know and it really springboards things and we really get physical when we're actually kind of like prototyping and you know we're living and breathing this play and we're constantly kind of like reiterating and we are becoming those kids as well at the same time when we're actually developing um this to uncover what what could that interactivity be you know like the the Lego bricks are very, very physical, right? So, you know, it's kind of, and it's very intriguing. You can get into flow state. It's, you know, it's a very interesting play uh, scenario to get into. And the interactivity part of it is really interesting kind of like area in which we're exploring and how we explore it um, and the new ways in which we explore it are really interesting to bring out kind of like these insights, observations and truths um, when we're observing with kids. Can I just jump in just a, uh around like because I think there's something quite interesting about the question around technology itself and I, I know Andy touched on it here but you know as you can imagine we play and we test and many of the people on this call are like at the forefront of what's the latest what's the greatest technology how can it enable us to to get more play into the world but also get more play more accessibly into the world and I think some of you know if we talk about hidden side there was an amazing play in that I think what Andy's alluded to already is that sometimes technology can almost put barriers up between you and the play. And when we're talking about interactivity and when we talk about social connections, actually where we've been working together, I would say, and that's not going to be like, that's not confidential, is that we want to remove barriers to play in whatever guise that might be, whether it's a technology guise, whether it's accessibility to more play in your life you know our play unstoppable campaign for girls is that's what it's all about we want more play in more kids and adults lives and technology you know just because we can doesn't mean we should mm -hmm. and so you know like if it's creating a barrier between you and the play then that's wrong that's the opposite of that interactivity and that social connection that we want to advocate for for and so i just kind of wanted to allude to that as well is that you know like the mission we're on when it comes to interactivity is more play in more hands more accessibly without the barrier um whether that's a screen or not mm -hmm. but yeah i would just yeah, build, build up on what amy says this is totally you know absolutely correct especially when people talking about you know my area the ai and ar or you know all these and um, there's it's you know this is we're living in the crazy uh, Iran is a time that you know all the AI new technology coming out every day. Um, so for us, it's super important to actually identifying like what does those technology mean to the Lego group, to the play, you know, to what does those technology mean? What are the impact on those technology to to kids, to our product? You know, those uh, those are the important questions we are trying to answer, and those are the technologies we are trying to build. And back to the uh, augmented reality, the Lego, the Lego group has been uh, pioneering on the technology development for many years, like even back to 10 years ago, long before the hidden side, um, Lego group already have like AR based product like Life of George and all of, all of that. So we've been continuing working on this for so many years. And, um, you know, um, to uncovering what can we do to, you know, um, like seeking this kind of seamless integration uh, between between the uh, physical bricks and the sets and to this kind of digital play experiences. Fantastic. I want to I want to take this opportunity with technology and thinking about technology to talk a little bit about how it is that you collaborate. You're sitting in different locations talking about technology as a barrier or potential barrier or um, an enabler, uh, how do you collaborate uh, across these different past spaces? And, and maybe you could also talk about, there's not just one uh, location for Creative Play Lab, right? We're, we're located in several different parts of the world. We are indeed. Um, technology has to be an enabler for us because like you say, if I think about the play propositions team, 
we've got a third of us in London. And again, not in not all of us, like I'm out in Oxford, not all of us in London, we've got a third of us in Berlin, we've got a third of us in Singapore. And so, you know, technology is the way we connect. We laugh, we cry, we celebrate, we commiserate, you know, depending on, on what the week's giving us. Um, but yeah, like we have basically sponsored by teams a lot. Uh, I would suggest <laughs> the wonders and the pitfalls of some of these enablers. We've we've been trying and testing, I would say, all sorts of ways to connect ourselves. Um, it doesn't take away from the face to face, but we have different teams set up in different ways, physically as well as virtually. Um, and I know some of the other teams across this are more successful uh, than others at kind of using technology to enable that, as well as like what you physically have to be doing together. We're forever experimenting on these, like forever experimenting. I, I, it almost feels like our every day is an experiment just to try and see if we can find something different or something new. Um, and then when you find something new, you then want to try something else out as well. So, you know, we we are physically creating things. So we have to get better at being able to be in multiple locations. Like how can we make it really work for ourselves in LA, across Singapore, across different, you know, different time zones? Um, so I think we've really sharpened kind of like the way that we work, but when we get together, that's where it really, really sparks. That's where we really, really kind of like make sure that those moments are the moments where we have to really challenge ourselves and ask those really big questions. And that's kind of like when we can physically get together and constantly practice play daily, daily, daily. Um, and that helps us to solve those really challenging kind of like problems. You know, we almost play our way out of it. I love that. Uh, that you're getting me into sort of the next thing. Uh, is I wanted to know, how do you play? Uh, this is the Creative Play Lab. You must be the most playful people in the organization. How do you play in your daily work? And how does that play kind of uh, support the work that you're doing? I think we all do it in multiple different ways, right? So I think we could all chip into this. I'm not going to start. I'll let someone else start. Andy, you're smiling so much. I'm only smiling because I just remember all of those moments when, uh, when you know, when I see the creation from Liz compared to mine, I'm like, man, I'm really embarrassed, right? Uh, I mean, one of the things that we do a lot is we, we like to use Lego bricks. Uh, and, and I think there was a period of time where we said, hey, you know, spend the next 10 minutes, create something that is mm -hmm. what you're feeling right now, right? Uh, and, and we did that. Uh, and this is, again, one of those moments where I, I look at Liz's, I'm like, okay, crap, I need more, you know, more maybe studies here. I don't know how to build these things. But, uh, and, I, and I do think this also helps us to understand how each other thinks. Uh, so it's not just about play. It's also about how do you interpret the world, right? How do you interpret mm -hmm. your, your emotion? Uh, and, and some of us are more 3D, some of us are more 2D, and some of us would have, again, tell the story. Um, and we, we actually do a lot of that in, in some of our meetings. In the beginning of the meeting, you know, a five, 10 minute play session, a different prompt. Uh, there's probably a, you know, this series of things uh, and we sort of go through and, and we try to understand where each other is really coming from. And I think those are really interesting sessions that I have found so far in the Lego journey. Hmm. I mean, it, 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 I read, so we have like meetings and stuff and, uh, and we have get togethers. And it, it's all about kind of using play to build resilience, to kind of like, you know, to be brave, but also play and books can also help us to kind of like learn things. So I use kids books to, to, to literally kind of like say to the team, look, here's a book about beautiful oops. It's okay to make mistakes. You know, actually something beautiful can come from a failure. Um, so there's this book called Beautiful Oops. I read it to the team and it just helps to kind of like in a really simple way, and quite playful way resonate with what's going on you know there's the the red the red hen uh, the red hen i think it was the last one that we read as well which is about constantly people saying no to you like how do you build that resilience when all of a sudden you're getting no 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 and uh, and we're just learning from kind of like you know how kids learn as well in that really playful way so there are multiple different ways i think in which we do it um i would say liz that the, this is a prime example of you being as andy's already talked about you being a play catalyst we have people in our organization who are much naturally more playful, I would suggest, than some. And they're, they're catalysts and they help us be more playful. So we have like inventors, we have, you know, just naturally very funny people, like dry sense of humor, crazy sense of humor, you know, 
Liz usually dresses up on a lot of our like quite serious calls, which helps to alleviate the tension because we have to remember, you know, like we do work in a big organization and, you know, being the play catalysts means you still have to be quite serious about some of the stuff we're up to. But when you have someone who dresses up and just puts a smile and a, a belly laugh in your, in your day, it makes everything feel much better. Mm. But, but I also think there is a, I mean, there is that side of it as well, but there is a seriousness to it on how it can actually help. And I, and I always use that analogy of rough and tumble. So rough and tumble for me is, you know, in a playful way, rough and tumble is really, really important because it helps you to challenge each other, right? And you're building on top of it and you're building on top of it. As soon as rough and tumble gets a bit too serious, that's when you've gone out of the play zone. That's when you need to kind of bring it back a bit. And, you know, and you don't want it to be hurtful because we need to have this safety realm around us. And that's what play does. It builds this safety barrier. It makes us feel protected, but it also makes us feel kind of like brave in challenging each other. And I think it's that rough and tumble and making sure that we're not going into the serious rough and tumble. Um, but, you know, it, we have serious play as well. Um, and I think it's important that, you know, this is not about silly this is actually something that's quite powerful uh, in a business. Yeah, I was going to I was going to add to that. It's like that safety is is very key. I think that's actually part of the reason why kids are are kids, right? Is cuz kids feel safe. Like if if there's one thing that let's say parents or or people who are acting as guardians, like like make kids in general feel safe and that's part of the reason they feel so okay with just jumping into whatever thing they want to jump into and humor and play in general even with adults can make them feel safe and and more okay with innovating with trying new stuff and with and with not potentially having a safety net all the time right like like it it leads you to want to jump off the cliff a bit more often when you know you're in that safe spot right and so yes we're we're playing but what we're really doing is sort of trying to keep a mindset going that like sparks creativity in a way that isn't hindered by some of the safety issues that other companies have to deal with right doesn't mean that we're completely floating free off the planet and we don't have to deal with anything but it just does mean that like we're given a little bit of a space where we can push out onto the skinny branches a bit more than most and kind of like goof around out there. And, and sometimes that comes back with like really cool ideas that like a large corporation can still, can still use in, in, their daily, in their daily goings. I think if, if you also use play in, in, a, in a hard situation, right? So you've just received some news or an email or something and you're just kind of getting, and you're feeling a bit stressed, right? It really helps to balance this out because if you turn around and said, right, I'm just going to switch my kind of like curious, playful mind on, you would then go, oh, I wonder why I'm receiving it like this. I wonder what, like you get into this wonder state where all of a sudden then it becomes, okay, actually this is not too bad now. So, I, you know, there is the kind of like ups and downs and trying to kind of level it out and in which it really helps us to, to really push forward. I was going to say the creative energy, Liz, that yeah. we all feel as a result of that. Not, you know, like you say, when you get into the flow, but like the creative energy that you re-engage mm -hmm. with, you know, like work is, work can be hard. Yeah. Like even when you're playing hard, right, you can still be exhausted. So sometimes changing it up means that you get a little bit more energy in every day. And you think about things in a different way. You see life in a different way as well, to, to Liz's point. I think by way of like the experimental nature of our work as well. We don't get everything right the first time. We fail a lot. And I think even when you're playing a game and you might fail a level over and over and over again, but you still had fun, encourages you yeah. to go again. And I think sometimes that's a big part of it as well. Like we're having fun together, we're playing. It's a mindset of, yeah, even though it was difficult and I didn't get it, I'm happy to go again because the process was actually quite great to go through. It's interesting. All the things that I'm hearing from from you is about uh, it, it's about play, and of course you're building play for children, but you're also using play and you're developing a culture through play in some ways, right? Uh, it's kind of informing how you uh, how you interact together. It's informing the processes that you create. Um, can you talk a bit about culture? What is the culture like inside of the Lego Group or inside of the Creative Play Lab? 
I, I think I think that's a very open-ended question. I think a lot of us have very different cultures, even within our own individual groups. And part of the reason is because play is somewhat of a personal thing, right? And so, like, you might have a team where play means on Fridays we get together and we do this or that. Or it might mean that every time we have a meeting, we end it with three dad jokes and a, and a song and dance. Or it might mean that the next design review, I can, I can ask painful questions where I'm wearing a cowboy hat because I'm using a voice and I'm saying, but I don't get it, right? It, it doesn't matter. Like, that. the particular culture of the team might be radically shifting. And so I think... I think for me, the culture of Lego is there's an enormous number of really, really talented people and really, really creative people and really, really hardworking people. The one red thread that I've seen throughout all of Lego is that everybody seems to really actually care about kids and about the future and about doing the right thing. And so for me, like that's the one piece of culture that I would say is somewhat common. Other than that, man, oh man, that's a big fat question right there. I was going to say, would you say, Brian, like there's a healthy tension if we're all like quite open with, with it, which is like, you know, as innovators and pioneers, you're like, come on, what's taking so long? Um, but, you know, we work in an organization who has extremely successfully, Andy talked about it, optimized every part of the production process, every part of getting play into kids' hands around the world. And we're here to like disrupt it. And there's a really healthy tension between us and some of the organization going, whoa, whoa, whoa. You, you know, we're 91 years in here and we know what we're up to. What are you saying to us? And so actually there's something really wonderful about, you know, listening, learning from what works as well as coming in and saying, yeah, but what if, you know, like, so that healthy tension, it, it pushes us. And sometimes the pace can be different between people, your ambitions of like, but we've already got this really amazing business. We've got billion dollar products in kids' hands already. Are you mm -hmm. telling me I've got to decide which one of those to take off the shelf to put this that's untried, untested, but, you know, on the shelf? You know, there's that really wonderful, like, we're probably more risky, less, more risk um, appetite in the play lab than maybe in some of the organizations. That healthy tension is real and pretty cool actually, because, you know, when you get healthy tension, that's where the magic happens as such. And I think that's probably a very deliberate thing, right, within the Lego group is understanding that we need to continue to challenge ourselves uh, as an organization to think about what what is it that we need to do for the future generation, right? I think to, to Brian's point, you know, the, the red thread that really cuts across is really trying to do the best uh, for the future generation for kids, adults, and family. How do we help to bring all of those uh, things together? Uh, in a ways that we probably don't even know today, right? So, so I do think uh, by design, the organization has a strong desire to continue to push, uh, to continue to challenge ourselves, uh, all for the better of the kids uh, around the world. So. I mean, and the other, the other healthy tension that I think we feel just simply because we're a global organization is that you can make something that's pretty cool, but can you make 10 million of them is, is mm -hmm. another big fat, sort of intensity thing that comes at Lego, right? Because the scale of doing things globally is a different thing than, than, than other companies. Yeah, I think that probably tips into this question about how about our strategical priorities. And I'm not quite sure if, if in this group we can answer it, but I'll just ask it anyway. It says, how does the Lego group uh, strategically prioritize and manage R&D investments to drive innovation while maintaining the integrity of your core product. And I think if I get to the, the heart of this question, I think it's about um, the fact that we, we are innovating and we are bringing in new technologies, but we maintain that core. Um, and, and maybe what is the balance there and how do we, how do we come up with that balance? Oh, it's a looming question. Um, I mean, it, this is where the healthy tension comes in, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thinking about like, um, you know, we have we have some very clear processes in the organization. You know, if you think about for anyone who's been in a startup organization or like built their own business before, you know, you're looking for investment. Do you have to get past certain innovation points? You know, it's like, are you clear about who your audience is? Is it desirable? Is it feasible? Is it viable? And those are the same questions we're asking ourselves, you know, in the play lab, like, 
we 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 always need to de-risk for the organization to feel more confident that what we're putting into the world is a play experience that is really going to help kids with their learning through play agenda is going to keep us relevant resonate and and be here in the future you know lego is has an ambition to be here to stay relevant and i think you know we are go we go through investment stages just like any startup would which is like you know is it right are we hitting the right notes when it comes to desirability feasibility and viability and if we're not we can it you know mm -hmm. or we put it on the backlog or we pivot like any good organization and i think so that's kind of our innovation process that would be familiar to some people who who work in innovation or who have been in the startup world before or built their own things i think then the balance between the core is you know like we already know things are working so until we see they're not working we wouldn't why would we change it and i think that's where we have to have the balance of like this has to be better and we can classify better in a different in many different ways but it has to be better than what we've got in order to keep play in the world and that's where like our core there will always be an opportunity uh, a, a trade off should we say about like what is this better than and we then have to have those really tough trade off conversations but the more evidence that this group brings to the table around our experimentation kids voices kids championing it um a, alongside the commercial side of it because it's it can't all be about the commercials then we stand a better chance of having that tough discussion and tough trade off negotiation as such really great answer yeah. to a hard question i think amy thank you i want to shift gears now because we've got about 5 minutes left uh, four minutes now um and i just i can see a lot of questions in there about um training about uh what kind of qualities do we look for when we hire in cpl do we have internships if we could just talk a bit about what makes um a, a creative play labber what are what are the materials that we're looking for in those again this is going to be different for everyone i think um across the board but you know i mean within kind of like in play discovery as well we're looking for those pioneers who can be on the frontier who are you know are used to kind of like ambiguity and, and not knowing where to go and can really be curious and wondrous um you know from different types of backgrounds as well it's it's you know i love the diversity in the groups we have so much diversity which is really really kind of like relevant to what we do because we're changing constantly the way that we approach things so we never really have one process that fits all because it depends on where we're going. So, you know, we put our backpacks on, we arrive somewhere and then we go, what tools have we got? Now we need to make some new ones because we've gone somewhere we haven't been before to uncover something new. So really kind of like looking for for, for that kind of point of, of difference, you know, who can come in and challenge, um, who, who really feel comfortable with the unknown. Um, and I think with regards to kind of... Um, uh we're talking about kind of um learning we look at that differently as well so it's not kind of like hey we've got some courses and they're online and we're doing this we actually go in deeper and we create our own unique ways of learning um because we know that you have to change mindset we have to be kind of like you know dealing with these kind of like different realms so we actually personalize and create different learnings and kind of like really skinning people up in different ways Brian, I want to I wanted to add, which is one thing that I will say is like due to the physicality of Lego itself, a lot of what we look for are people that have worked in tangible stuff and like have a good sense of of that notion. Even in the digital world, it's helpful if you have some form of 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 physicality that you've that you've worked in as well. Um, we hire people from all kinds of crazy places, from the automotive industry, from people who make museum exhibitions. We have a guy that works in our group right now that was used to work in the circus. And so um, we have a number of people, but that that kind of physicality and that kind of like reality is, is important. The other thing I would say that's super important across the board is like, if need be, you need to get on the floor with the kids because a lot of what we learn and a lot of the way that we learn it is by sitting next to them while they tell us, right? And so, you know, yes, you might be, 
part of the go to market team, but you probably also need to have a little bit of like good patience and playful spirit so that you can sit next to the, the market <laughs> and have them and have them throw things at you and tell you which things are cool and which things aren't. Toby and Lily, bearing in thinking about the fact that you're the newest addition on this board right now, would you say there's anything you would add, like coming in relatively new? I, I think I agree with what Brian was saying about getting in the floor of kids. I think it's very much that I think there's a big difference between wanting to create something and make something. We all kind of want to do that, and it's the exciting part and put it out there. I think there's something really about where kind of on this journey with the kids and we want to be right next to them. It's not something we do on far or ship out or like here's something to download. It's we're right next to you playing and learning with this and we want to enjoy this as as part of the process. So even as part of like research, it's not, you know, you do this and I research and observe. It's I'm playing with you, what you observe and what you enjoy. It's something I should enjoy as well. And I think that's a big part of like something I'm seeing in CPO a lot. Yeah. yeah, and I joined here over a year ago. Well, which I wouldn't call like re like that new. The so, um so but oh, what is you know I'm being impressed by the um, you know Creative Play Lab is that um it is everyone come from so different diverse background. Um, you know, I, I was um uh, it, this is completely different culture comparing with you know as um you know we're developing technology if we're sitting in the uh, technology organization technology company this is completely different culture it requests um us to be more you know much more open minded and more be curious um to find a way to working with um completely people from the different background the different that completely working the different ways and this is really excited me fantastic i want to thank you all for joining us today those of you who are joining online live thank you for tuning in those of you who are watching the, the recording thanks for watching uh if we've missed anything any of the questions uh, we tried to get to them all but 45 minutes is a really short amount of time when we have such rich uh engaging and fun content to talk about um so we'll try to come back on some of those questions and i hope that you'll join us uh, next week for live behind the breaks thanks everybody Bye, guys. thank you Bye. Bye. so good to see you all nice to see you too <laughs>